Hey, little sister, what's the worst show ever? That Gets My Goat. Hi, everybody. Welcome to That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anglovich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And today we're talking uh, a movie again. It's been a while since we've talked a movie, and I, I think it's actually kind of been a while since we did a That Gets My Goat. But yeah, we're back at it. Maybe we should have let sleeping dogs lie, but instead we're, we're here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk the crimes of Grindelwald. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Crimes of Grindelwald. In dirty American, please. <laughs> the Crimes of Grindelwald. Thank you. Fantastic Beasts, colon, The Crimes of Grindelwald. My cousin took exception to it being called that. Yeah? For some reason, he, he thought it should have just been called The Crimes of Grindelwald, and it, there was something insulting about putting Fantastic Beasts at the top, as though we wouldn't know that it's a sequel to... Fantastic Beasts, and I told him, oh, dude, all five of them are going to have Fantastic Beasts, colon, and then the title, and he's like, that sucks. I I, I don't know. It, it was like when License Revoked was about to come out, and they decided the Americans were too stupid, and so they changed the title to License to Kill. I, I'm, I don't know if we've had a conversation about that, but I remember <laughs> being quite young and being insulted by that. It's just like, well, if I didn't know what revoked meant, I would seek out the definition and be smarter because of it. But anyhow, well, you and I weren't going to do an episode about this. I don't know why we didn't, but we never did one for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, uh, which came out two years ago. What prompted you to see the sequel? And then we'll go on from there. Okay. Oh, weirdly, my daughter really liked the first one. Weirdly? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. Okay, the Harry Potter, and I, and I know that uh, I think you would like to think of Lord of the Rings as being Star Wars for millennials. No, F millennials, dude. I, I don't care what they like. Oh, okay, Star Wars for whatever, that decade. But I used to say Lord of the Rings was Star Wars for the 21st century. And I still stand by that. Okay, sorry, for the 21st century. I was going to say Star Wars for millennials is Harry Potter. Um, because it continues to mean more to them than Lord of the Rings ever did. You know, the Lord of the Rings had its three shining years, and then it kind of went away, and then it had its sad prequel trilogy, just like Star Wars did. But I think Harry Potter, you don't see people still dressing up as Lord of the Rings for any, for, you know, for Halloween or whatever. Mm. You don't see people referring to Lord of the Rings still, but people still refer to, still dress up as, still do all sorts of stuff Harry Potter related. And they still have that thirst for more Harry Potter that they just don't have for Lord of the Rings. Okay. And it just seems to me like it's a pretty good equivalent. And now, yeah, now Harry Potter is having its prequel trilogy. <laughs> which I guess is uh, a must for uh, any show. But yeah, we went and saw that when it came out. You know, the first one, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Did I call it something wrong? No, you called it that. Okay. We went and saw that when it first came out. And then when Christmas came around that year, my daughter was begging for that DVD. She really wanted it for Christmas. And so we got it for her and... So now when this movie came around, it was pretty much like, yeah, we needed to go and see it. Uh, and I know you were not too keen on seeing it. You didn't want to see it. I think, had you heard bad things about it already? Or were you just like, nah, I don't care. The first one was enough for me. No, I, I liked the first one when I saw it, but it didn't stay with me. It didn't affect me on any level like the Harry Potters did. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, just the inferior prequel trilogy, as you said. But before 
the sequel before Grindelwald started coming out. Yeah, I heard a buzz that it was not good and that it had a rotten score on on the tomato ometer. And so I I figured I'd probably give it a little while and then you know I didn't have to rush out and see it as I did the first one. I, I believe I saw the first one the day it came out. But, but Wreck It Ralph is the one where it's just like, no, I'm not going to see that sequel. F you. And it's weird that I would say that to you, because what have you have to do with Wreck-It Ralph? I mean, you're my friend, but yet it's, <laughs> I'm not going to go see Wreck-It Ralph 2, F Big Anklevich. It's just, it's irrational, but you never can explain why people like or dislike what they do. Sorry. <laughs> but you texted me, and do you remember what you said? I do, yeah. I said, man, I wish J.K. Rowling would write for Star Wars because they could really uh, use somebody like that. You, you also said, are you planning on going to see that? And if so, you know, I would be curious to, to hear whether you agree with everybody else or whether you agree with me. And so <laughs> I thought, wow, well, if Big really likes it, and Big hates everything. Big is Mikey <laughs> from the Life Serial commercial. I was just like, if Big likes it, then yeah, I've got to go see this. And I sort of forced my cousin to go with me last night, even though he would have been fine to not, I think. And I don't know why that was. It, it just, it may be that, yeah, the Harry Potter series works for him because you read the books and then you saw the movies and now he's got kids of his own and he's reading the books to the kids. And that makes you fall in love with it all over again because you're seeing it through different eyes. I, I experienced that when I was reading Sorcerer's Stone to my nephews and, I, you know, doing the voices of the characters as they are in the movies. I'm just being surprised by how emotionally resonant and how great it was all these years later. Mm -hmm. This is the Harry Potter books I'm talking about. But there are no books for Fantastic Beasts. And, and anybody that says otherwise is selling something, as some movie once told you. The selling a screenplay? Because you and I have had this conversation before. All of those books that she released, the side books are not books. Yeah. Those are like, on, on the positive side, they are opportunities for charities to benefit from fluff. But on the negative <laughs> side, they're shameless cash grabs. <laughs> and I think you would agree with me on this. I remember when that book was coming out, and you're just like, no, I looked it over. That's not a book. Yeah, they're just screenplays made uh, uh, to put out as in book form. Or the Tales of the Beetle Bard. Yeah, the Tales of the Beetle Bard and all that stuff is what I'm talking about. Which, sadly, I bought that. Uh, oh, my And I God. never read it. I don't know. Did I buy it or did my wife buy it? You know my wife Your have wife must it. have bought it because you were better than that. Big. But I, we I, own it anyways. And yeah, I've never read it. I don't I don't know why I would. But anyhow, yeah, if there were novelizations of the screenplays, then I would say, oh yeah, there are books, but there aren't, uh, no. Yeah, why didn't they at least do that? Just get some Joe Blow writer? I, I don't know. But I, I think what you're referring to when you keep mentioning screenplays is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Yeah... And neither of us have bought that either. Yeah, that is what I was talking about. Because it just doesn't feel like a book. Did they not do a book at all for Fantastic Beasts? Or did, oh, they did some kind of crap where it was just like a bunch of beasts and like pictures of them and stuff, huh? There you go. It was, it was supposed to be like the textbook or some silliness, but you wanted her to write Star Wars. And in many ways, this feels like the prequels. Mm -hmm. where there are many, many nods to the originals that you love and cameos, and some are more gratuitous than others. But, yeah, something that really hit me hard from that first movie is how much I disliked the Ministry of Magic in America, mm -hmm. especially its president. It, to the point where I asked you at the time, is, is this Rowling's criticism of America and what we have done with her books and her characters, and, and she just sees us as this petty, small-minded, and racist, and backward. 
I don't think that there was an answer because we don't we don't know. But I remember when the many times we've talked about the prequels with a capital P, there was only one the prequels. <laughs> there were many times when I was just like, are we not meant to like the Jedi? And in Lucas's case, I think it's just shoddy screenwriting. It's a guy who doesn't know how to write. But in Rowling's case, after seeing the second movie, I fully feel like they were showing that the Ministry of Magic is broken and corrupt. They were showing, oddly enough, that Grindelwald had some good ideas and that he was not wholly evil. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. she, she had the guts to give this guy a bunch of positive qualities and traits and moments where you're just like, oh, I can see why, why people would follow him. I can see why people would applaud when he gives his speeches. And I thought that that was interesting. That was neat. You didn't get that with the prequels, but Lucas could easily have had Palpatine be super charismatic and have a lot of good points and stymied on every avenue by this backward Jedi Council or by this old-fashioned Senate or whatever to the point where you're like, gosh, I wonder if the galaxy wouldn't be in better hands if this guy were in charge. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and maybe that's the only comparison I will make with the prequels tonight, <laughs> but maybe not. I don't think so. I mean, that's where we started from, uh, so I'm sure we'll keep going. As you know, and, and maybe not everybody in the audience knows, but this was going to be a trilogy of movies. And before the first one even came out, Warner Brothers was so impressed by their investment that they gave Rowling the go-ahead to make five movies. So we're going to get five Fantastic Beasts movies, no matter how well or poorly the movie we just saw does. How is that a thing? And I thought about that. When have you ever had somebody have that much power or leeway or rope with which to hang themselves or whatever to say, yeah, here's a billion dollars and we're going to make five movies and you have complete creative control. I guess Lucasfilm making the prequels worked that way because he was financing it himself. But it's just amazing that Rowling has this plan that nobody else is privy to of where these movies are going but they trust her well enough because of the billions she has made for Warner Brothers to say, that sounds great. We don't quite understand what's going on, but we will finance it. You know, you go right ahead. You, you want to have a British guy with a really bad American accent at the beginning of this movie? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. That, that was just a bad example of, of a weird thing in this second movie. It's just like, well, why not just hire an American but more importantly, why was that character supposed to be American? Yeah, I was very confused by that guy. Definitely didn't understand. And, and he, was, he, he was confused. It, it was pulling me out of the movie. I, kept, I leaned over to my daughter saying, Hey, uh, why is there a guy with an American accent in the British Ministry of Magic? What is, what is going on here? I don't understand. But your daughter can't help you with that because it's not like... My girlfriend has read, read the, the books, book. <laughs> and she, she can be like, okay, okay, very, very briefly, th there are four houses, and each one had a founder, you know, that kind of stuff, because we don't know. As far as I know, she's making this stuff up as she goes along. But also, though, Rowling had always seemed to have encyclopedic knowledge of this world that she created, and somebody could say, uh, uh, Ms. Rowling, what house was so-and-so from, and she'd be like, yeah, he was Ravenclaw. And you're just like, wow, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, what was Ron's mother's maiden name? And she's like, oh, well, that was... And you're just like, how do you know that? Anyhow, I think the real reason we're doing this episode, and I'm sorry I just keep talking, but now I'm like getting amped up emotionally because we mentioned the prequels. <laughs> and oh, it's great. They, more than a decade later, the prequels can still get me so fired up. Oh, it makes me happy <laughs> to know that I can still care this much about those three failed films. But the reason that we're doing this is that I called you today and I was just like, 
wow, big. Uh, yeah, it's it's everybody and me against you <laughs> on this. If you really want to argue about it for an hour, yeah, let's do it. That gets my goat about it. And so I think that's what what's, I don't know what if, we're in for, even though I just can't stop talking. Yeah, I don't know if I want to argue about it is the thing. I'm not like upset at all. There was just things that I liked about it that I felt, and, and in this case, I'm not talking the prequels because they're over and done and gone. Um, and there was nothing to be revealed really in the prequels. It was just like, oh yeah, okay. So this guy here, you see him? He's going to be Darth Vader. Like it was all summed, the entire prequels was summed up in that one poster that they put out in the very first thing where it was just like the little Anakin and his shadow looked like Darth Vader. And they had nothing more to say beyond that. <laughs> they just made up a bunch of BS that was worthless in those prequels. But since those prequels and within the last few years, we've had several new Star Wars movies. And they've introduced us a bunch of characters and... There's stuff to learn about them and things to see where are they going and how has the world come to where it's at. And we had the first one, uh, Force Awakens, where they set all that stuff up and they said, okay, no, so you got this person and this person, and this person. We don't really know who this person is. We don't know who their parents are. We don't know why Luke has uh, gone away. We don't know what the hell happened, why the Empire is basically still around all this time later. Um, we don't know who Snoke is and, and what, what his deal is. We don't, you know, it just kept going on and on with, with all these things that are, are mysteries for us to find out. And then we had the next movie where they just threw all the mysteries into the fire and said, yeah, we're not going to find out about those. Uh, but thanks for coming. Okay, but sorry, let me interrupt, though. You and I are, I mean, even though you don't like the sequels with a capital S... <laughs> you and I still both like The Last Jedi, and we b like The Last Jedi more than The Force Awakens. Am I? Are we on the same page there? Probably. I like... Oh, okay. I, I thought we had had this conversation, and I was just like, oh, wow, you and I are on the same page. I'm trying to decide whether I like them more than The For whether I like the Last Jedi more than The Force Awakens again. <laughs> I guess I must... I probably said that to you before, but that was in December of last year. I probably still like it better just because there was it was new-ish. You know what I'm saying? It was Yes. Like The Force Awakens was basically just a pastiche of the original Star Wars movie. You know, it was the same thing, all the same stuff. They adjusted it around a little bit with this and that and the other thing, but it felt like they were just saying, Hey, you guys love Star Wars, remember? Well here it is. This new one was not that for sure i remember saying at the time that it felt like it was a combination of both empire strikes back and return of the jedi uh there was a lot of stuff that they threw in that felt like you know you had your your battle in the white planet uh with ad uh etc you had I mean, basically, uh, Empire Strikes Back was Darth Vader trying to catch Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon and everybody in, on there with him for the majority of the movie. Uh, so you had that in Last Jedi, where you have sort of a chase, a slow speed chase, which is really similar. You had like an Emperor's throne room scene, like from uh, Return of the Jedi with a, with a battle and... Emperor gets killed. Yeah, so there was a lot of stuff. You, I guess you had the Luke, I am your father in Empire Strikes Back and Rey, nobody is your father in <laughs> The Last Jedi. So they were also very similar, but I think I did like them better. They did, they did feel newer. Truthfully, I guess I didn't like what they set up in The Force Awakens to begin with. And, you know, they had to just build on that. You know, you obviously can't just throw it all out and start fresh. But uh, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm just going on and on. You just wanted to say we both liked them better. Yeah, and I don't even know why I'm bringing that up. 
now. It's been so long. <laughs> I went on for way too long. <laughs> it was it just that we were on the same page for that movie, which is so divisive for so many people. But yeah, I, I, we are not on the same page in this movie. But, oh, that's the point I was going to make. I don't want you to say, well, I liked this and this and this about the movie, only to have me say, well, I didn't. Because that's kind of douchey. You know, it's like, well, that didn't work for me. But that's basically what's going to happen here. I guess, is, is I'm going to say stuff that didn't work. And you'll be like, yeah, that didn't bother me. I don't know that we've had this big of a disagreement. Except for when we did Last Jedi, that review. I kept going on and on about how emotionally powerful the movie was. And your response was, eh. Yeah, I kind of felt that way, I have to admit. And that's, I mean, one of the reasons why I was saying, gosh, I wish uh, Rowling wrote for Star Wars is because I wanted the kind of stuff that happened in this movie to be in Star Wars, especially because Star Wars totally feels like that. You know, it's, it's very much like a medieval drama about, you know, this king and his heirs and this great knight and etc., and, you know, everybody is related to everybody. And, you know, even if you don't know, you find out it's got a lot of that to it. And then this new one just kind of, all of that's gone. It feels like nobody's related to anybody. And the people that were still around from before are now all dead. One way or another. I mean, Carrie Fisher is still alive in the movies. But they can't do anything new because she didn't shoot anything for the new movies. Um, so I don't know. I just, I, I feel like it has cut the ties that connected it through all those other Star Wars movies, you know, and now they're just like, no, 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 no. Sure. We, we got Star Wars in our title, but you know, we, we're kind of like, you know, other movies. There's other spacey movies that we're also like, if you like those movies, you should like our movie too. Okay. The thing that really that made me say that, and this is jumping all the way to the end of the movie. Oh, yeah. So, so spoilers, guys. We're going to spoil the crap out of this. There are credits at the end of the movie. So there you go. I covered the end of the movie. That's right. Yeah, right at the end. I guess they do this a, a few times during the movie. We try and find out who our orphan from the uh, previous film is is the guy who what was the creature that his like it, i want to say it was like a vindictus or something does that sound right or is um, is that silly could be it i mean all their names are silly it's not any worse than like a boggart or a uh grindy so uh, yeah definitely. yes <laughs> but my, i have a cousin that was maimed by a grindy and so to okay. me it's not silly at all if you'd seen the scars <laughs> he has one nipple well, we have something in common, finally, then. Sorry, it's called an obscurus, the parasite thing. Yeah. Okay. So he made this thing, and it was super powerful, and it was, you know, really destructive, and we didn't know who he was. He was just some random guy that was living in a... a it was an orphanage, right? Like an orphanage that was run by somebody who was very against witchcraft. Yeah, there, it's like I, I felt like she was like the foster mother and she was a religious nut and uh, yeah. all of the kids were creepy because of it. And surprise, surprise, one of the kids was a witch. Who would have known? Anyways, yeah, they had uh, several times where we looked at what this kid's history is because he's still around and now he's in Europe and... He's in love with Voldemort's snake. Oh, is he? Well, I thought they were a couple. Huh. And then at the end, he just ditches her because he wants to find out his past or whatever. So he goes to, uh, right? Oh, well, what? I, I don't know. Did she, she stayed on the good side and he went with Grindelwald? Is that how it ended then? I believe so, yeah. Okay, but, but that's neither here nor there. What, the point you're getting to is we find out at the very end. We find out at the very end that Credence, our orphan, is a Dumbledore. He is the long-lost brother of Albus Dumbledore. I, God, what is his name? 
He has a an A Dumbledore name. Yeah. Let me I, see I, if I a search in the internet will get it for me real quick. See if some a holes has spoiled it. So that big twist ending. Okay, here we go. Aurelius, is that it? Oh, okay, that sounds good. That's a cool name, Aurelius. You knew Marcus Aurelius. I didn't say I know him, I said I met him. Okay, so he's Aurelius Dumbledore. And that's why he's so powerful in magic, is because he comes from a family that is powerful in magic, just like Dumbledore Albus, who is the uh, greatest wizard of our time, they say, and the only person that could possibly defeat Grindelwald. And they're trying to get him to fight against Grindelwald. Well, see, I liked that because that was set up at the very beginning of the movie where Grindelwald says to his second in command or you know through the creepy chick this boy is i believe is the only person that can defeat or kill dumbledore but we don't know why and then that's revealed at the very end why he feels that was grindelwald also prevented magically from harming from attacking dumbledore that they had an unbreakable vow kind of thing between them is that right i believe that's the deal they have an unbreakable vow between them so that they can't hurt each other and so i think that might be why uh they're they're all working through surrogates to to try and thwart each other see i i found that interesting we talked about well maybe we never have on the show but the revelation of the nature of the relationship between Dumbledore and Grindelwald, which Rowling released in an interview years after the books were done, when the movie began, I, I wondered how into detail they would go with that. You know, how, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say explicit, but how open they would be Overt. about that relation. Overt, that's a good word. And when Dumbledore first says, I can't fight him, just my assumption was, okay, we know the reason. We viewers from the 21st century know the reason, but the people (laughs) around them don't. And I thought that was kind of cool. But yeah, later in the movie, they show those two make their vow. Mm -hmm. And so... That explains why he couldn't do it. And uh, yeah, then that's broken at the end of the movie. Well, it's not, but there's the promise of possibly breaking it at the end of the movie. Right, because the vow is kept in that little thing or something like that, that the little creature stole and they can destroy that thing possibly and then he can, right? Yeah, if they can destroy that thing, then Dumbledore will be able to fight Grindelwald. That's set up for a future payoff which this movie was rife with. And if you don't mind, I'm going to bring up my first criticism of the movie, which is they introduced so many new characters Mm -hmm. as though these are all important people that will play a part in the future. Important. And again, Rowling has this canvas where she's going to be able to tell five stories no matter what. And because of that she can afford to introduce characters that will pay off in the fourth movie or whatever. But I felt like as a movie with a beginning, a middle and an end, it was to the film's detriment. And it was to the characters from the first movies, the main characters detriment as well. For example, Tina, who is like the second lead in that first movie had nothing to do in the second half of this movie. She was there but she did nothing. And I felt like, oh, well, that's kind of a shame. Because the main female character in Crimes of Grindelwald is Lita Lestrange. And I keep saying Lestrange, why? (laughs) When everybody says it Lestrange. Do any French people say it the way that I do? But yeah, she's the main female character, and she is given so much in this movie, so much spotlight She not only gets a flashback, she gets multiple flashbacks with two different actresses playing earlier versions of her, which is astounding. She's given her own motivation, her own secrets, her own love triangle, to the point where I thought, oh, well, maybe we're supposed to want 
her and Newt to get together rather than Newt and Tina to get together, which was what I uh, initially assumed we were supposed to feel. And then they just kill her at the end of the movie, but they kill her in such a way where it's just like, oh, so all of that didn't mean anything? Because she says, I love you, and she looks, and the two brothers are standing together, and the way it's shot, was she talking to Newt, or was she talking to Newt's brother? Handsome Newt. Did he have a name? (laughs) His name was Theseus. Oh, you know, I don't know if I can call him that. Can I just call him Handsome Newt? If you want. Why don't you call him Frog? You could call him Frog and then the other guy Newt. Okay, that works. So yeah, she dies, and that's not really resolved. I, I felt like we were supposed to wonder if she wanted to be with Newt rather than Frog. There was just so much focus on that character. The mystery of her past, what her secret was and all that stuff too, was important, but well, why? Yeah, I did think it was really weird at the point where they go with all the aurors to uh, Hogwarts to talk to Dumbledore. They charge all in there like a bunch of a-holes like every government official does in a Harry Potter show. They threaten Dumbledore and stuff. And then Lita Lestrange (laughs) walks over and like sits down at her old desk or something. And then she just has like this five minute long flashback where she remembers being with the brother of her husband. Beyonce. Oh, just a fiancé. They never got married. They never closed their nuptials. I just found that weird because she wasn't the character that mattered. And, and why were we getting this really long backstory for no reason? Like at the point when she has this backstory, we don't even know who the hell she is. We've hardly seen her at all. You know, we had the one scene at the very start where... She talks to Newt before Newt then talks to Frog and gets a hug from him. And that was one of the weirdest parts, I thought, was where she was talking to him. And and it was shot in a very strange way. It was, like, really close up and kind of out of focus. And it was bugging the hell out of me as I was watching it. I was really worried that it was going to keep doing that. Luckily, it didn't. But it felt like it was supposed to be, like, Newt's... Uh, point of view is Asperger's syndrome kind of this is how he sees the world or whatever but they didn't keep doing that which was good I can't understand Newt sometimes too he has that weirdness with certain people but then other people he doesn't like he doesn't have a problem with the baker guy the fat baker I want to say his name's Jacob Jacob Kowalski he doesn't seem to have any issues dealing with him he just tells him stuff and orders him around and all sorts of stuff (laughs) uh but with other people he seems to have issues can't look at him in the face or or something i don't know well there's that moment and it was in the trailer where newt's (laughs) there's so so many names where (laughs) tina magics frog the brother of newt sort of blasts him back and newt says that was maybe the greatest moment of my life and i remember seeing that in the trailer and being like oh okay that tells us a lot about their relationship but in the movie itself frog was a totally decent guy from beginning to end with absolutely no flaws he was a (laughs) square-jawed hero And there was no bullying, there was no judging. He tried at every opportunity to help Newt. And so I was just like, oh, I don't get the resentment then. I don't get that line at all. Unless it's that Frog is marrying the love of Newt's life. Which seemed to be what the movie was saying, except for that it ends the way that it does. And who cares then? I, I I don't know. I just I didn't feel like, and and maybe that's emblematic of the whole movie for me. I didn't feel like it made sense, and that it worked story wise, and and it's a shame because the, as the movie begins, you see these 
other ministries of magic. You see the American one, you see the British one, you go over to France and you see like their secret society, you know, a way to enter through that creepy statue, the magical underworld over there. And it was just so jam packed with awesome world building and detail and creatures and characters and color where I was just like, oh my gosh, this is such a brilliant creator, writer, storyteller rolling. But by the end of the movie, I was just like, none of this works. I feel nothing. I'm confused. I'm completely checked out. And there's just like this huge action sequence with like fire dragons at the end of the movie. I didn't understand what the stakes were. I didn't understand what was going on. And I didn't care. And those are huge strikes for a movie for me. I, mean, I don't know how you can strike harder than those three. I didn't know what was going on and I didn't care. But you didn't feel that way. Well, I wasn't as... I wasn't as invested in it as uh, maybe I made it seem. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it either, I have to admit. I did go after watching it and like look on Rotten Tomatoes and it had like a 39 or something. And I thought, a 39? Mm -hmm. Holy crap. That's like... Uh, but that's rotten, right? That's what a bad movie gets. Oh, that's way the hell beyond rotten. Like, I think you get under a 60 or something and you're rotten. Uh, you know, this is like... Give me a name of a really bad movie. Uh, just like, what has Michael Bay directed in the last decade or two? And there you go. Okay, well, let me look at there. Did you really want a specific title so that you could look up to see what its Rotten Tomato score was? Is that what it was? Well, no, I was just going to uh, say that's like what, you know, this movie or that movie got. But I wanted you to give me something that was just like a terrible name. Well, let's look up the Johnny Depp, um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and see what that got. Although... Uh, I felt like that was a better movie than this. Well, I'll just I'll just use the Transformers. Oh, okay. Like uh, trans the first Transformers movie got a 58. Are you kidding? No. So we I'm got not. not only better reviews, significantly better reviews. Exactly. And like trans I don't know which one is which. Let's see. Revenge of the Fallen, I guess is the one that came after. Yeah, and, so and uh, people all say that's the worst of, of the bunch. But okay, who cares, well, because gonna... the 2007 one was uh -huh. awful. I, I mean, it, it's just like, it should have been career-endingly bad. Yeah, that was the last thing that I saw of them, so I don't know any of them. But the third one, Transformers Dark of the Moon, got a 35. Okay. Which is basically the same as what this movie got. Well, see, now I'm feeling sorry for the movie because it wasn't... I mean, Michael Bay is a terrible filmmaker. <laughs> he took these things, you know, that, that should have been... They should have sold themselves. And, uh, well, of course, the, those movies still made a billion dollars each. So who cares what I think? But it should not have been hard to make Transformers movies. And, and, and they're just unwatchable crap. But the man who made this movie and the movie before it made, you know, the last few Harry Potter films, which, especially those last couple, people love those movies. Those are, those, I'm sure they got extraordinarily high reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know. I, I referred to the movie as a train wreck earlier when I was talking to you, but now I want to amend that, because the, the <laughs> Michael Bay Transformers movies are a train wreck crashing into an orphanage filled with mentally disabled children of color. That's how much of a, of a tragedy those movies are. Whereas this one was, the train missed the station. Yeah, it didn't stop when it was supposed to and left a bunch of people standing there going, Hey, that was the train I was waiting for. Why didn't it stop? Oh man. See, I never saw another Transformers movie, and I, <laughs> I can't say that I never will, but... I don't think I ever will because of how much I hated that first Michael Bay movie. But Crimes of Grindelwald, even though I didn't like it, I'll still go see the third one, hoping that it's a step up from this one. 
So yeah, I, I apologize if I made it sound like it was awful. Uh, dude, the Transformers movies, the Michael Bay Transformers movies, make the prequels look good. So I, yeah, I just, I, I, I guess hell has a basement is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> and so there are levels of bad. Uh, but can we go way, way, way back to my earlier complaint, though, is all of these new characters that are introduced... Frog. Mm -hmm. uh, Grindelwald was in the first movie. He was, you know, in a different guise. Yeah, he was in disguise as like the lead aura or whatever. So it doesn't matter. So, so that's a continuing character. But the dark-skinned French guy who was a Lestrange uh -huh. is a new character. Obviously, Lita Lestrange is a new character. Nagini, the... Where the snake? Is it okay if I call her that? <laughs> I believe they called her a maledictus in the movie, so you could call her that, or you could just call her a where snake. She's a new character. I know that there's three or four brand. Oh, you know what? Albus Dumbledore is a new character. That's true. Yeah, he wasn't in the first one, was he? I remember when they put him in the trailer, and everybody was like, "Oh, it's Dumbledore young! Wow!" It's almost like when we saw Obi Wan young. I actually quite liked Jude Law as young Dumbledore. And Me too. When they announced Jude Law was cast, I was disappointed. And do you know why? Why? Well, because Jared Harris is an actor who is the son of Richard Harris. He played oh. Moriarty in the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes things. And I was just like, no, 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 that's perfect casting for a young Dumbledore, the son of the man who played old Dumbledore. But they... They didn't go that way. But I found uh, Jude Law likable and charming. And uh, I mean, he didn't look anything like Dumbledore, but who cares? It's 70 years earlier or something like that. Right. So, and Dumbledore was completely covered in beard and hair. So you, he could be played by any Santa Claus guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I did like him. But again, it's all world building it's all introducing pieces that will go into play later in the game mm -hmm. like they introduce a boyfriend for tina who is also an Auror, sir not appearing in this movie and will they won't they with tina not resolved in this movie and everybody that was from the first movie, with the exception of Cadence, damn it, Credence, <laughs> is... I thought his name was Cadence, too. We should change that. Let's see if we can retcon it somehow. Uh, none of them progress as characters. They don't develop as characters, except for Credence, and then Pretty Sister, Tina's sister. The, she had a name... It was a weird name. Um, Queenie? Queenie, there you go. Thank you. Queenie's the name that you give, like, a poodle. <laughs> she had the, the, such an interesting arc in this movie of turning to the dark side, but with good intentions, with good reason for it. That, that's something that I liked. That's something that I dug, that she had her reasons, and in the end... She surprised me. She went with Grindelwald. I thought that, you know, the good angel on her shoulder would talk it out. And, you know, she was tempted maybe for a minute. But, you know, now she's back on the side of good. I thought that that was cool that she went with him and is part of his his team. But, of course, you know, that's moving pieces for the the later movies to resolve. I don't know. I just didn't feel like this worked as a movie on its own it worked as like the second night of a miniseries that's going to go all week long. <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing is I had no idea that it had been expanded to five movies at, at some point. I, I thought, and may, maybe this wasn't the case, but back when they first announced this Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, that this was just a, this is a standalone adventure in the Harry Potter world. It's going to be a one movie thing. I mean, it's named after the fucking textbook that <laughs> Hermione would always quote. So, you know, it's not, 
it's not something that people are going to be all invested in. They're going to want to see a full-on trilogy of. I, you know what would have been much better a title for this film is if they picked another one of those damn textbooks. Like Hogwarts A History is the name of the next one. And uh, what I don't know what all the textbooks were that she would always quote from. but uh, Oh, and the third one could be called Defense Against the Dark Arts. Yeah, there you go. Am I right in thinking it was originally just a single movie that has now ballooned into five? Oh, you know, I, I don't know. I know I that before the first movie. movie ever came out, we knew that this was the start of a big thing. Yeah, before it came out, then I thought, you know, at first it was a single movie, and then at some point they said, oh, no, this is going to be a trilogy. And everyone's like, a trilogy? About the textbook? <laughs> yeah, and now, now I hear, I had no idea that it was five. I assumed our last movie is the next one coming up. That this was, I still thought this was a trilogy. And, you know, the next thing is, okay, it's face-off between Grindelwald and Dumbledore and uh, Aurelius. And Wait, who's Newt. Aurelius? Like, Aurelius is Credence, Clearwater Revival. You mean Cadence? Cadence, Clearwater Revival. <laughs> Clearwater, we'll call him that if that's okay. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Now you tell me that it's a five movie thing. And, and you say that the next one is set in Germany? Yeah, each one was supposed to be set in a different country. And the first one was America and the second one was going to be France. And yeah, now it's, they, they're saying the third is in Germany. And I believe that's where... Grindelwald goes at the end of this movie. Yeah, I think so. How come we don't get to see beaux batons in this movie? I feel gypped. I, it didn't even occur to me. You're right. Huh. I assume it, it... Well, actually, no. Like the... What's the other one? Durmstrang? That's... That one's not in Germany, though, is it? It's like in Bulgaria or something like that, right? Oh, I just naturally assumed... That it was in Germany. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's what I thought, too. But I think it actually isn't. I think it's further into eastern europe which seems strange like why is the triwizard cup not germany it, that seems the obvious third leg yeah you know because <laughs> that is basically europe is britain france germany and then and then everywhere else all the rest like you know kind of take up their position behind that you know what i mean does every country have their own little i mean it seems to me like every region even like the you know the united states couldn't just have one magic school they'd have to have like an east coast and a west coast and a you know great lakes and a steep south and etc you know you got to have one for all the places yeah i would think so but it seems to me that hogwarts is for the whole united kingdom like probably even including ireland or am i crazy because like no no i i i don't scottish kids there at least like Yes, they did. Cho Chang had a Scottish accent. Yeah, wasn't that weird? I'm <laughs> not saying that it was a, a weird choice, but it just, that accent didn't appear like it should come out of her mouth. But, <laughs> sorry, uh, is your opinion of the film changed at all in knowing that it's two of five rather than two of three? That does surprise me a lot. I wonder if she has all the crap planned out for the rest of them, that there's going to be five. And, and you say it doesn't matter what happens. There was an article that my wife was mentioning as we were driving home from seeing the movie that this was the lowest ever Harry Potter opening. Yeah. Did just terrible or something like that. And, and it got a 40 on Rotten Tomatoes, which is obviously not a glowing review. Is it really going to be... No matter what? Or, you know, is there the possibility that it'll be like Divergent, where they just oh. did three and then it was time for the fourth one? Like, nah, it's not worth it. Cost too much money and we didn't get any return on it. Screw it. Because it seems to me like there's always that opportunity. I mean, this is business. No matter what you want to say about Hollywood and art, they are business. The people who finance those films you know it's not warner brothers that's actually financing the films it's banks that are financing the films and warner brothers puts their you know nads on the line 
when they borrow from these banks. If things turn south and it looks like they're already on their way, are they really going to go through all five? Huh. Yeah, well, I guess that's a question that they are asking themselves right now. Yeah. And of course, it having come out here in America and nobody cares except for the first weekend, we've complained about that before, all eyes are now turning to China to cement uh-huh. this as a success or a failure. And yeah, I think it's probably fair to say that if it tanks in China, that maybe the third one will be the last. It will be a trilogy. Yeah. Because like Star Wars, for example, you would think is a freaking untouchable behemoth. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like it is just going to plow forward. Yeah, good point. And there is nothing. No one can stop the juggernaut. And yet after Solo came out and didn't do well, all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, yeah, maybe we won't do that Boba Fett movie. And maybe people are just tired of Star Wars, so maybe we'll start making less of them. We'll just do the trilogy movie, and then we'll we'll think about it. And the other behemoth that might be out there would be, I would think, Harry Potter. You know, you would think that Harry Potter can just do no wrong, but maybe not. No, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great comparison, because... Solo made uh, 150 million more worldwide than Fantastic Beasts has so far. And yeah, that, they, they seem to have put that to bed. Not only future Solo sequels, but yeah, all these auspicious plans that they had for this movie and that movie. But that just seems to be, you get a paper cut, so you burn down the library is what that seems to be. <laughs> but also... Solo cost a ton of money. Yeah, that's the I think a big difference between this one and that one is that Solo they spent double what they should have on it. You know, they made the movie, then they made it again. Yeah, but like Solo got a seventy on Rotten on Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Fantastic Beasts Two will do better financially than Solo in the end. Because of the lack of budget spent. Oh, no, no. Just because uh, it's already made nearly $300 million worldwide. And it just barely opened here. And it hasn't opened in several markets. And so mm-hmm. I assume that it's going to But do they that. have a much lower bar to jump over because they didn't double the budget, you know, to what they should have. You know, that, what they that's have. true. So, I mean, they've probably already made their money back. Getting, whereas Solo had to make so much money just to make its money back that it was almost guaranteed to lose money, even if it did great, like, you know, all the other movies were making a billion. Right, but, but that was a given. Because it had Star Wars in the title, it was going to make a billion dollars. <laughs> just It is a, uh, whatever the opposite of a miracle is, that Solo crashed and burned as hard as it did. Yeah. It's still... A head scratcher and the answer is myriad why several factors had to line up several dominoes had to fall for solo to implode the way that it did and i i fully expect the next star wars movie comes out a year from now to do just fine it's like yeah do it you cleared two billion worldwide no problem nobody lost their job over that but I, solo is just this outlier that wow that movie failed and uh, it'll never happen again, kind of thing. I, I, I don't know. If the budget hadn't been gargantuan because of, you know, Ron Howard making it again, I don't know that it would have made a dime less than it did. But it would have made a but profit. it would have had a better net. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the gross wouldn't have been different, but the net would have been substantially better. <laughs> that actually means something. <laughs> But yeah, you know, uh, Solo got a 70, Last Jedi got a 91 on the Tomatometer. Okay. This one got a 40 on the Tomatometer. And so, obviously, there have been series of movies where one did one was really good, one was not so good. Like, for example, the Harry Potter movies, number six, I just did not like. Number six is Half-Blood Prince. Yeah, I... I That's the one that... Cloves didn't write. That one was terrible, but 
you know, I went and saw the next one because it was Harry Potter. And maybe I knew the thing ahead of time, you know what I mean? Maybe because I'd read the books, I would go and see the next one anyways. But sorry, sorry, rewind. You felt like Crimes of Grindelwald was better than the Half-Blood Prince? Because it was not. I couldn't say, to tell you the truth at this point, all I'm saying is that I really didn't like Half-Blood Prince. Okay, well, yeah, and I didn't either. It, it, it was sort of a failed adaptation where they took things from the book and chose to focus on them, and they were kind of the wrong things. For example, they never focused on the Half-Blood Prince and the mystery of that and the importance of that, yet that's the title. And that was just right in the middle, kind of, of that series. But I still went to the next one. But with this, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I guess we could talk about things that we did like. There, again, there were just a bunch of really interesting creatures and monsters that they introduce. And magic that is fun. And I really enjoyed, uh, like, Queenie's journey to the dark side, like you were talking, just the... You wouldn't expect it. She did. She seemed not the one that would do that. I would have much sooner believed uh, Tina being won over to the dark side than Queenie. Queenie seemed like such the nice, wonderful, happy person. See, I would have liked it a lot more if Tina had been the one to the dark side. Because emotionally, I mean, she's the love interest. She is the female lead. She's the person that Newt wants to be with, I guess. And for her to go over to the enemy's port. Plus, she had so much more of a dark side than Queenie did. Right. Queenie was like a little cheerleader girl. And... Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why it's so surprising. And the, the thing about it, too, is that Kowalski is my favorite character in this whole freaking movie, you know, I, or in, in the whole series. In that first movie, yeah, he, he just ruled. Yeah, every moment he yeah, was I'm in. I'm not a fan of Newt. I, he doesn't do it for me. Weirdly, my daughter liked Newt a lot, but I just... Because he's damaged? Is she one of those? Yeah, I don't connect to him at all. But Kowalski, I really enjoyed. And yeah, to see the love of his life going down a dark path. Here's a quick question for you. That's a side thing. This, you can't marry somebody that's not a magic person. Uh-huh. Is that a just a new rule that they threw in there? Because I don't remember ever having that be, being a thing. And would there be a half-blood prince? <laughs> it's just like episode two of the prequels, where suddenly there's this new arbitrary rule that... Uh, that Jedis can't marry? Oh, uh, but, but, but I mean, it was worse. It was like, they can't have any emotional connection. They can't... I, I can't even remember the words they used. They're not even allowed to masturbate to porn. Well, Kit Fisto did. Um, yes, yes, he did way too much. He turned to the dark side in the end, though, and that's why. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, f I feel like that wasn't there in the first movie, and that it was created solely to be a plot point to get us to where we needed to get Queenie, boy, that name to where she needed to be in, in this film so that she'll be where she needs to be in the next film. Yeah. But it was really strange that she has bewitched, that she has charmed, that she has hexed Jacob Kowalski in this, the first time we see him. Mm-hmm. Because it just, it seemed like an out of nowhere. It, it, it seemed something a bad guy would do it seemed like something i would do it seemed like something bill cosby would do <laughs> i found that 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 kind of uh interesting but but they were showing us i guess from that first scene that she's on the border yeah, that she's, she's malleable or, or whatever yeah she's willing to play fast and loose with the rules but yeah i, I found her story to be interesting and i still say and i know you didn't like it but I, I like the what's the word the dynasty the dynastic things that were put in there where we've got oh i'm the brother of dumbledore the long lost brother not the brother of lestrange long lost brother <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay well here's another thing that i did like and it sucks that i like it because it's wrong but 
every single little cameo and nod to the Harry Potter movies that was in this movie. I was just like, oh, oh, cool. Uh, McGonagall. Oh, Hogwarts. Oh, oh, Boggarts. Oh, they're doing ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. I loved all of that. And yeah, my cousin complained about McGonagall being in it. Just like, oh, dude. That's like when Yoda turned. And I said, oh, it's not that bad. But <laughs> Or Nagini being in it. Did you like Nagini at all? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, man. She, she did nothing in this movie. I criticized True. Tina, but she was there for no reason except for that she was pretty and that she's Asian. She did nothing, <laughs> dude. Well, they didn't want it to do well in China. Isn't that what you said? I hear you, but it's just like she they, they introduced her early on, and you're like, oh, this is going to be a, an interesting character. Or plus, oh my gosh, we know that name. This is Voldemort's snake. Uh, and then she's a hanger-on with two lines of dialogue for the rest of the movie. Right. Well, maybe she'll be something... I mean, there's three... There's a whole trilogy still to come. Maybe she's a huge part in that. Yeah, I, I, hope, I hope so. I want to believe that Rowling knows what she's doing. Because those seven Harry Potter books are amazing. They are an accomplishment unparalleled in anything I have ever read of planning and setting up and paying off and things that don't seem important that are important once you've yeah. read the fourth book or, you know, all of that stuff where it's just like, holy crap, the, the internal consistency, it's, it, you know, the plan and sticking to the plan and that stuff amazes me. I have no idea. I, I aspire to be a writer, but I don't know how you can do what she did. At all. It, I, I, I wonder I, if the reason this movie is so much like that is because that first movie, like what I was saying before, it wasn't meant to be the first of five until people said, no, this is really good. Let's really go for it with this thing. Let's do five of these. And she's like, oh, okay. And now all of a sudden she's got to lay the groundwork for three more movies that come after this. And so she you really went for it on the groundwork. I wonder if... It has anything to do with that. That's probably a good point. A lot of the characters that get introduced in Crimes of Grindelwald were not initially in her plan for the Fantastic Beasts trilogy, or whatever you want to call it. And a lot of this is, dare I say, padding. And, and now we're going to have this character that has her own arc, and that's cool, so that the, the three movies can become five and it won't feel super bloated and worthless like the Hobbit trilogy did. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope the next ones are better because of this. Yeah, in which case, I wish her Godspeed. I, I hope that she can pull it off. And maybe the next movie will have the advantage of, I didn't think this one was very good. But the next movie only has to build upon that and continue. And suddenly all of these characters are familiar to me. And I was like, oh, hey, Nagini did something in this movie. Wow, that <laughs> automatically makes it better. Nagini, when it comes down to it, Nagini never really did anything in any of the earlier movies either. <laughs> Aside from getting its head chopped off. But yeah, but it, it was he was not a character. He was a... He was a pet. He was the Disney animal sidekick. <laughs> right. He was the the raccoon from Pocahontas, or the uh... <laughs> well, he was he was Iago from Aladdin. Yeah, but Iago at least had something to say. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I think we've talked way too long, probably about this, and hopefully, it all turns out okay in the end. Like you said, I wish her Godspeed. I hope she can manage to, to make all five of these movies work together as a good series. And someday we won't be looking back at it like we look back at the Star Wars prequels or the Hobbit prequels trilogy, whatever you would call that. I guess we'll see. We'll see if she can manage to, uh, to not fall down that same pit that everybody that has a great property seems to head right for. Um, maybe she'll see the thatch that they've put over the pit and she'll go around it. Who knows? We'll see. 
We've got three more movies, no matter what. So <laughs> well, now I'm questioning that. Too. It's like I maybe I did like this movie. <laughs> Anyways, we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, and we're gonna call it a night. Thanks for listening, everybody. Any final thoughts you want to say before we go, Mr. Richelfield? No, it's she has created a, a wonderful world that a lot of people want to live in or come visit. And uh, I'm happy that there are more to come. I don't feel like the bridges are burned. Yeah, I just hope that I'm more pleased with the next one. So there's cool. that. All right, everybody, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to That Gets My Goat. I'm Big Anklevich. Hey, and I'm Rich Outfield and Lumos. Uh, Petrificus Totalis. Totalis? <laughs> Ooh. You, you beat me on that. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'm, re- I'm really good at dueling. Hello, this is Graham W. Cox, legal counsel for Doonstief LLC and That Gets My Goat Enterprises. I am happy to announce that Chris White has been added to our law firm as a full partner. Nice to have some good news for a change. I am here to advise you that this program is produced under a Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 3.0 license. You are free to download the show, share it, and listen until your ears hemorrhage, but the files cannot be sold nor made claim upon except for with written consent by Little Johnson, White, Cox and Wang. Feel free to comment on the page or in the message boards at doonstief.freeforums.org. Follow them on Twitter, like them on Facebook or dislike them in real life. And of course, F. Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I looked up Durmstrang just for fun, and Rowling says that it's in Scandinavia. Northern Scandinavia. Oh. So, is Bulgaria in... No, it is not a Scandinavian country. It would be a Slavic country. Hey. That's interesting. I had no idea that Durmstrang was... I assume because I think the guy... What's his name? The great Quidditch dude that comes... Victor Crumb. Yes, Victor Crumb plays on the Bulgarian Quidditch team. Ah, okay. I think that's why I assumed it was Bulgaria, or at least the surrounding environs. Anyways, um, we've wandered far afield. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.